Okay, so <coughs> we get into the formal part of the course. So we'll look at something called DH parameters, which are used to quantify robots in space. We look at transformations in 3D, not today, and then uh, forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. So this is this module. I think we'll manage to get this far in the first minor or maybe a little bit more. So now, <coughs> the first thing is what is a model? Okay. Now, obviously we all understand that we are going to link and control the robots to computers. Okay. And computers deal with numbers, so we have to quantify everything. So we have to somehow learn to quantify the robots and their environments. Now this is something which is typically not done when you do Robocon okay? or school robotics. You do not have a quantified model of the robot in terms of forces, masses, moment of inertia, distributions, lengths. You somehow patch it together and make it run. So uh, a course is all about a robotics course formally learnt is all about managing to quantify it so that before you build a robot you know how it will perform. So that's the deal. And we call these quantifications like this, we call them models. Now, <coughs> so the important question now is how consistently should these models mirror the physical device they represent? And which characteristics of the devices are to be represented and to what degree of accuracy? Okay. Now suppose you are an air conditioning engineer and you are interested in this room. What are you interested in? How many people? What is the air volume? That's roughly where it is. If you are an interior decorator, then you will ask me, okay, what is the color of the wall? What is the color of the ceiling? Okay. Do people who come here wear colorful clothes or do, do, do they wear drab clothes? So, you know, so the different questions and so you have end up with different models. So for the air conditioning engineer, the color of the room does not matter. For the interior engineer, that is paramount. So you have to think in terms of this as to what is the end use you are putting it to into a model. And so, but if you model everything, in the environment completely, then it becomes too large a model to be effectively useful for design purposes or simulation purposes. So we have to keep this in mind. In terms of, specifically in terms of manipulators, we are interested in geometric, kinematic and dynamic models. So I am looking now at a geometric model. Now we are interested in the interrelation between links of the robot okay? and so we are primarily concerned with only positions. We are still not interested in how it moves and what happens when it moves. So just how are the robots connected to each other, the links connected to each other, how do they form the full structure. Okay? So that is we are interested in the geometry. So now we talk about a kinematic model. Now we are also interested in velocities and accelerations, okay. but to build or to analyze velocities and accelerations, I need the underlying, underlying geometry model. Without the link lengths and without the various angles, you cannot get the kinematic model in place. So you always build a kinematic model on top of a geometric model. And then finally you have the third one. Gain, this is gone, which is a dynamic model. And it, in, when you start doing the dynamic model, you start incorporating uh, modules which will give you the forces, moments, torques applied by the motor, the joints, internal forces in the links. You might need it to design the structure and the forces applied by the end effector. You know, it could be a drill or it could be a hand grasping something and the workpiece. So, you need to account for all of this. And so obviously, you know, as you go down this list, it becomes increasingly more and more complex. 
you can more and more uh, involved as a design tool. So you build the dynamics model essentially by applying Newton's laws or equivalent uh, to the acceleration velocity being known to the kinematics model. Now you don't always apply Newton's laws, we will find out there are other ways of deriving equations also. Uh, actually we will not cover it in this course, but there are other methods. So, but for our case dynamic model will build on top of a kinematics model. So once you got the velocities and the acceleration then you go back and you calculate the forces and the. So now we need to talk about the accuracy of a model. Now we will see that for most of this course, for all of this course we will model the links as rigid. Okay. In reality all structures deform, there is nothing called a rigid structure, there is a rigid model. So if you take any structure and model it as rigid, it is by definition you are in error, okay. but we live with this error. Okay. Now if you say okay, I want to increase the accuracy of my computation, okay, you can start making the robot stiffer and stiffer, but stiffer you make it, okay, you would add more weight to the links, so then you have to drive those links. So it does not become a tenable solution. So there is a middle in the middle, there is a position in the middle. But the whole point is irrespective of how stiff you try to make it, we understand that our underlying model is still in error. Okay. You cannot make it exactly stiff. So now in spite of this does the robot work? Yes it does. Okay, and it will work as well as you can measure. So if it is stiff, uh, if it is if it is flexible, and I'm designing working with it, right? And you say, okay, I have measured it. The end deflects by two millimeters. If the end deflects by two millimeters, I can move the motor motor a little bit more, so that the end goes exactly where you want it to go, so that your error goes to zero. So this you do by using what is called a controller and so there is this whole bunch of people in electrical engineering, at least in IIT Delhi, seven of them in the controls group who spend a lifetime working on this problem. So their motto is if you can measure it, we can deliver it. Okay, so well you still need some, some issues in the structure, if, you, if it is not controllable then you cannot do it, but if it is controllable then you can get there. So we live with this error. Now this is a very important part of robotics that we understand that there is going to be some modeling errors always, but through a controller we have got to come to the right solution. And <clears throat> so the complete model of the robot and more importantly of its environment, a robot does not work in isolation, it is always interacting with something, it is not a steam power plant. Okay, where you say okay, I put in coal and I wear at so much degree centigrade of water of this and, and you just run, that is not happening. By definition of a robot is that it always interacts with the environment and the environment is very difficult to model because there are surfaces and textures and everything, it is a more complicated system. So it will become computationally very expensive and so the whole deal is that we built an approximate model and we employ feedback to make the practice of robotics as accurate as we want to do it. So now what we will focus on for next several lectures is on the manipulator. Okay. So this is a KUKA uh, ARC manipulator. So let us have a closer look at that. So you can see this moves around, so there is a first joint at the base which is moving around. Okay. 
then this is the second joint, third joint, third joint. Now, look at the wrist area, the end of it. See, there is something turning, there is something turning and then there is So, there are 5 joints here. This is a 5 degree of freedom robot. Now, as I changed each one of them, there are these joint angles which changed. Now, joint 6 is 0 because this is a 5 degree of freedom manipulator. Okay. In general, there are 6 degree of freedom in space that you know for a long time. So, you need a 6 degree of freedom manipulator to, to orient itself. But we will find point out later that there are many tasks which has one circular symmetry. If you are drilling, Right? Whether you have the drill bit like this or you have the drill bit turned by 180 degree does not make a difference. If I am writing on the board how I hold the chalk, the angular orientation does not matter. The last one rotation along the axis. There are many such tasks. So, a 5 degree of freedom robot is fairly good if you are spray painting, welding. So, it is quite standard to have 5 degree of freedom. And what you see here in the 4 by 4 array is a matrix which represents the coordinates of the uh, axis which you see at the end. Okay. So, this represents the position of the end of the manipulator. So, we will as we go along in the next couple of lectures we will learn how to find out what is the position and orientation of the end effector given this that is basically find out what this matrix looks like if I know what these various joint angles are. Okay, so, so, this joint angle is changing. So, we will figure out how to do that. So, why do we want to do that? We want to do that so that we can build animations like this. Okay. We want to do that because if I actually build a manipulator, so the task that I will have, I will say, that, okay, you go and put a screw in that corner. I will have coordinates of the corner, but I have got to move one motor at a time. So, these are the tasks which I want to do. Okay. So, let me get back. And you notice that finally, Along each of these axes that I had in the problem, I am somehow putting in a coordinate system. Okay. Now, this has been done nicely by uh, Rajiv uh, with the mechatronics lab. So, this is a downloadable piece of thing. So, you can download it and play around with it later. I will give you the URL. So, we now have to figure out first that how do we attach these coordinate systems to each and every link of the robot. And then we will figure out how to understand how they lie with respect to each other and then later on we will again figure out what happens when they move around. And then much later towards the second uh, last third of the course or the middle third of the course we will be doing the dynamics of it. So, <clears throat> restrict ourselves to developing in the first module, the first next couple of lectures to developing geometric model of the robot. We will set up coordinate systems which we attach to each link, derive interrelations through a set of transformations and evolve a mathematical description of the robot in that process. So, now links and joints we know that a joint is a connection of two links and what is the link? The connection of two joints right. If you gave this definition in school, the teacher would have caught you by the ears, right? It is called a circular definition, is not it? But really, we cannot do away with this duality. See, for example, what is the line? It is a join of two points, right? Shortest distance between two points, whatever. And what is the point? It is an intersection of two lines, right? That is fundamental. It's issue of geometric duality. You just cannot do anything about it. Okay, so below that I have a quiz. Can you attempt it? 
Hmm? Okay, so that's another duality, right? A line is the intersection of two planes, and a plane is defined by two intersecting lines. Now, what happens if the lines are not intersecting? Then do you have a plane? You have an infinite number of planes, right? So you don't have a plane, you have an infinite number of planes. So we have to live through this definition, okay? And at least I have not been able to resolve this any better than this. Now, <clears throat> the next thing on the agenda is something called DH parameters, Denavit and Hartenberg parameters. And <clears throat> So it is interesting to, if you just think back on the KUKA, right, you had this funny shaped links, right, with protrusions and everything on it. Now, those shapes are determined by the need to, you know, the size of a motor, where the wire comes out of, what is a connector, okay, and things like that. At a geometry level, what is important is location of the axis, okay. Where are the joint axes? They are the important things. And for rotary joints, it's very simple. For these kind of cases, you just have a center line defining it. Okay. Now note, this is really not a rotary joint because from this configuration that I have shown you, I can not only rotate about this axis, but I can also move this in and out. So this is a cylindrical joint. For this to be a rotary joint, I have to constrain it in the axial direction. But once, but so, but anyway, a rotary joint, you have a unique axis, and you can say, hang on to the axis and say, this is the line that I'm interested in, which defines the axis. But for a translating axis, it's more difficult. Why is it difficult? You take this, we understand that in some sense it translates in this direction. Okay, it translates in this direction, but which is the line? Is it this line? Is it this line? Is it this line? Or is it this line which is going here? Okay, so there is essentially a family of parallel lines which is, have a direction which is same as that of direction of motion. And if you remember your planar kinematics, Right, this is equivalent to having a rotation axis at infinity in a direction perpendicular to the direction of motion. Okay, so we have a little bit of a problem with translating axis. Okay. It does not seem to be unique, but it does become unique once you say it's at infinity in a direction perpendicular to it. Then it's at a unique location. But that's funny mathematics. Now, <clears throat> we now get to we draw a funny link which is bent and the ends are at different angles. So you have a line passing through this and then I have another line passing through this one. Right now deliberately shown tilde and then shown bent and not coinciding with this axis. Ideally I should have bent this but my uh, Microsoft Word skill, I mean, time allotment is not good. Maybe I need to change the figure later. Now, <clears throat> how are these two lines related in space related together? So there are two unique parameters, right? There's something called a common normal, right? And you know from your graphics course, that it might be tough, but you can always find a common normal to two for two lines, right? And that is unique and is also the shortest line connecting the two lines. So two nice properties. It's unique, the shortest line connecting the two lines. And what is other, other measure? It is called a twist angle between the two lines, right? That's also known, that there is an angle between the two lines which can be measured. There's a unique angle which can be measured in a plane which is normal to the common normal. So, what we do is we use the length of the common normal 
since it's unique and we then end up calling it in, calling it the link length. So this is very similar in planar kinematics you just took the length between the two joints and called it the link length irrespective of how the link went. So in this case also we do something very similar except that the joint axes are not parallel so they are tilted so you have to find the common normal and we call that the link length. So what we then do is we take this one of the lines and we translate it in a parallel manner along the common normal until it comes to the common point of intersection. So we take this line and you move it along the common normal you intersect it somewhere. Now both of these lines are perpendicular to a common normal. So now this line Li and Li translated and Li plus 1 they will form a plane, a single plane. In that plane I can measure the angle between them and call this angle alpha which is the twist. Okay. And that angle is measured about the common normal. So, yeah. This angle is not clear. Not clear. Let us try using pens. So, you have two lines in space. Okay. So, if you look carefully, you say, okay, find the common normal which goes from say here down here, right? Somewhere here. So, what I do is I now move this along the common normal until they intersect, right? So, now these two obviously now form a plane and the common normal is the, is the normal to this plane. So, I can then measure the angle between the two of them, okay? So, this angle is called the twist angle between the two lines. So, now <coughs> from this line, so the revolute joint is then characterized by, okay, so let me just step back a bit. Okay, so, I have defined the link, right? It has two of the lines at the ends. I find the common normal, I measure the length of the common normal, there is a link length, and I measure the angle and I call that the link twist. Now, I am coming to a joint. So, when I have come to a joint, now a joint is between two links. Okay? Now, when I say it is between two links, so there is a link going this side and then the link going the other side. And this is the joint I am talking about. So, since this is a link, this link owns a common normal. And this link also has a common normal. Okay. And this joint axis which is there is perpendicular to both these common normals. So, if I now want to go from the intersection of this common normal with, with the joint axis and this common normal with the joint axis, there is a separation between the two, which I call the joint offset D. Okay. And then, if I take this common normal and I move this parallel, I can again take this, I can move this up and then I can extend the line obviously. So, then I have angle between the com earlier common normal and this common normal and I have this angle theta. Now, this is called the joint angle. Okay. So, these are the two parameters which are there at the joint. Now, the next thing is just visualize this link moving with respect to this link. So, what will happen? This will rotate. So, this normal will rotate. This one is fixed. So, this angle will change. Okay. So, for a revolute joint, it is this joint angle theta which keeps changing. 
Now, if this happens to be a translating joint, then what will happen? These two will move apart and the joint offset will change. Okay. So that then becomes the parameter for a translating joint. Okay. You can have more complicated joints. You can have screws, you can have cylinders, but it's a problem because you know we for the longest time we live with only motors available to us, only rotary joints. Then now very recently you get some top-notch linear actuators, okay, which are not made by motors driving screws, but direct linear actuators. Last 10 years, there's some very good ones which are available. So essentially you want to make a robot. So these are the two joints or two kind of joint motions which are of interest, pure translation and pure rotation. Okay. Now, <coughs> we looked at these parameters, okay, the link length A, the link twist alpha, joint offset D and joint angle theta. So, they were evolved by these two gentlemen called Dinavit and Hartenberg and so they are called DH parameters. So, if you look up, people will be talking about DH parameters. You want to buy a robot from the market, you, usually the company will tell you what the DH parameters are. So, then you can build models and <coughs> you can go through with it. So, at this stage, we know how to measure some parameters at the joints and the links. So, the next step is now to attach, is to assign a coordinate system to each link. It is very important to assign a coordinate system because later on using this coordinate system, we have to calculate a moment of inertia. <clears throat> now, mass does not matter on the link, once you, once you measure mass, its mass is where it is. But if I want to measure moment of inertia, I need a fixed coordinate system of some kind. I can do it about the center of mass, but still I need some axis. So the idea is that you evolve a set which is fairly universally accepted and this DH parameter set is universally accepted. So we will now use this DH parameter set to assign a set of coordinates to the link. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we attach joint axis x i y i z i to the ith link. So this is link i. We attach coordinate system to the ith link um, of the manipulator, starting from the base as link zero. So this is part of my convention. So the base link I call the zeroth link, and then I start moving up. So, the axis zi is fairly clear, it lies along the line of the i plus 1th joint. Okay. It lies along the i plus 1th joint, not the, so the z2 axis will lie along the third joint. So, typically z0 will put along the first, there is no other reason not to do that. So, that is a convention that you follow. Now, this becomes a little busy slide but let us go through it. Okay. Now, when we are talking about lines, right, we say okay, I have a revolute joint, so I just put a line through it, right, that is quite okay. But now, once I want to assign axis along a line, I can have two axes, right, one pointing upward, one pointing downwards, or one pointing right, one pointing left. Okay. And so you have two axes along the same line, but they are opposite in sense. Now for zi, you can pick any one. You either make it go up or go down. Okay. So since we always start with the definition of the zi, you can pick either one. The only thing is the corresponding value of alpha will get flipped by 180 degrees. Okay, so, with, if, with one of them you had alpha equal to 0, other one you will have alpha equal to 180. So, if you have alpha equal to 30, other one you will have 210. Okay, so, that is the only change, which is something that we can live with. So, when we do our, when we derive our matrices, everything will change. So, finally, the physics will come out right, I mean the object 
the object will still be the same. Now, now next part, okay, so I have assigned the z axis. Let us say I have assigned it like this. Now, I do not have the same problem with the x axis because even though the common normal is a line, there is a sense of direction because I can go from the earlier link to this link. So, that gives the common normal a sense of direction and you create x1 along that direction. Okay. So, the sense of x i is from joint i to joint i plus 1 and it is then unique. So, we do not have this problem with um, <coughs> now, what are the catches? So, immediately you can see there is something funny which is going on. So, if now what happens is uh, what happens if z i and z i plus um, z i minus 1 and z i are parallel, then how many common normals do you have? Infinite. So, you have a problem. So, I can come out with a host of such similar problems, right. So, I will deal with them as special cases later, okay. And these are not, not really special cases because actually when you design a manipulator, you design it to have these special cases, okay. And why? Because if you make them parallel, then alpha is 0, right. So, that means sin alpha becomes 0, cos alpha becomes 1. So, it is life is nice, right. It is good. So, that is important. So, you get to, um, so we will look at this little later in the model, module. Now, the third axis which is the y axis is established as z i cross x i. Okay, so, that is why I have shown this in this uh, very light blue color because it is not of significance because it does not physically correspond to uh, a measurable quantity. Okay, so, you are primarily interested in uh, x axis and the z axis and you completely eliminate the y axis. If you need it, you can always generate it using a gross product. Okay. So, let me just uh, head back and uh, to the KUKA so that you can have another look at it and to figure out how many of these funny cases are there. Right, so this is the first axis, right? First rotation axis, so okay. Then you have the second one. Are these intersecting? No. Are they parallel? Nothing funny, right? What about the third one? Parallel. Hmm? Parallel, right? Fourth? Parallel to? Not parallel, non intersecting. Okay. Fifth. Parallel to second and third and intersecting the fourth. Okay. Now, <coughs> the designers have deliberately done this, right? They have deliberately done. Uh, created this because later on when we do the inverse kinematics and perhaps even the forward kinematics, we will find out that it makes your life simpler if you have this structure. Okay. So, let us quickly look at two special cases. The to last link yeah. Being parallel to the second and third axis depending on at what angle the fourth axis is. It's, if we turn the fourth axis yes. around 90 degrees. Yes. Yes, there is the, so um, we will get to that. There is this concept called singularity, which is there, where uh, depending on what position it is. So obviously these angles they change uh, the configuration, and there are some geometric properties, fundamental geometric properties about the degrees of freedom, which can change when you change the various angles. So if you look at the hand, right? I mean, you say, okay, the fingertip can move in any direction, right? It can move in any direction. 
Is that always correct? No. If I fully stretch my hand out, right now my hand cannot move further in that direction, right? So you, if you say that my hand can move in all directions, that is correct, except when you fully stretch forward, then I lose the forward direction. If I fully stretch up, then I lose up. If it's hanging down, I can't move it down any further, right? So these are subjective degrees of freedom. Okay. So we understand it intuitively and we will do in this course how to figure out uh, there is an exact measure. Some determinants on some, some matrices, matrices will go to zero. And then you can say it has lost a degree of freedom. So that's very nice because if you have a matrix, you can just put it in MATLAB and you can figure out if the determinant is zero. Right? That's very easy to do. And, and when, is, when, when is it zero and then based on that, you can you know, change your algorithms and things like that. So that is important. Okay, so we will do one special case only today. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, um, there is nothing special about them. They are the commonest thing which you will find in the industrial manipulator. But they are special from a pure geometry point of view. In pure geometry, you should have you know uh, your A, alpha, theta, D, all non-zero and non-90 degrees, non-infinity. Okay, so all of them, you know, very nice numbers. So that is the general case. But that does not happen in life. So it's like your chemistry, right? You used to write, you know, CN, H2N plus this. You used to write the general equations, and in the exam, what turned up? All the exceptions, right? So it's something like that. Anyway, so we look at this case where two successive axes are parallel. Okay, so we have two parallel axes. Um, <clears throat> so if this is the ith link, then the lines of the joint contain the zi minus 1 and zi axis. Now assume that this has happened somewhere in the middle and then you have been assigning coordinates from the base from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you are marching. Okay, so this is a serial robot. So there is a sense of coming from the base up. So we are following that. So i minus 1th frame is already established. Okay. The axis of the zi is established. But we cannot establish xi as there is an infinite number of common normals. So which one do you select? You select the normal is the one that passes through the origin of the xi. Oh, there should be xi minus 1, yi minus 1, zi minus 1. And if you do this, it sets di equal to 0. And then since the lines of axis of the two joints are parallel anyway, alpha i equals 0 as well. Okay. So theta stays as a variable and a then becomes the distance between the two axes measured along any of the common normals which is the same because the two lines are parallel. Okay. So we will stop here today and I guess we are going a little slowly because of uh, well, because the beginning of the course too cold and too early in the semester. Okay, so we will catch up in a hurry. And uh, um, so for the next class, we are going to do the special cases. There are four more special cases. Actually, there are only three more special cases. Two are very similar. And then we are going to take a manipulator and we are going to assign the coordinates to it. Okay. And we will try and do it online so that I do it on the imager while... Uh, you people can do it in the class. So uh, try and come with, if you can, with uh, at least two color pens so that you can kind of distinguish it as you go along and you can do it as you proceed. Okay, so we'll estimate the parameters as well as uh, assign the coordinate system to it online as a practice example. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow.